Welcome to the data collection methods uh, module. Today we will be discussing a little bit about um, general concepts and helpful, helpful tips that will help you um, perform successful data collection uh, for different kinds of projects. My name is Veronica Andrade and I'm very happy to be here today to share a little bit of my experience in the subject. Um, so a little bit about my background, I am actually born and raised from Quito, Ecuador, um, and now I'm currently talking to you from Houston, Texas, where I've been living for the last couple of years. Um, I am an industrial engineer, and I also have an MBA with a focus on business analytics and data uh, business modeling. Uh, so throughout my career, I've always worked with data related jobs. Um, my projects have always have involved um, data collection that we would further monitor and evaluate to make decisions on better efficiency or different things. So I started off with um, oil and gas, which very engineering focus, focused audience um, or peers. And then I transitioned to completely the opposite. It was a children's hospital here in Houston and completely different environments, but same type of work, doing different projects around, finding ways to think, make things um, more efficient and better utilize uh, resources. So that's a little bit about me and I'm very happy, as I mentioned, to uh, share my experience and that the past eight, nine years that I've been working on this. So let's dive in. So today, um, here's a little overview of what we are going to be discussing. Um, just quickly, we're gonna go through this. Uh, we're gonna do an overview of the data collections and a very high level process of the process flow, principles and some success tips that I can share with you. Um, we're also going to discuss uh, how to choose a software. Um, in this case, we're gonna make an example about Excel and R Studio, which is very popular these days. Then we're gonna go through basic data collection tools and what are the most common use strategies and very simple things that you can use on your day-to-day -day jobs to make this more organized. Um, then we're gonna discuss complex data collection analysis, um, those methodologies that are a lot more complex and will require a little bit of more training or expertise in the subject. Then we're going to look into choosing the right tools. Now we will know and discuss the basic and the complex, and then we're going to figure out how do we actually decide which tools are the best ones for my collection flow. Then we're going to discuss very briefly on some descriptive and statistics and how would that be applied to data collection and how to manage that. And the same with the statistics and monitoring and how those tools are later applied to monitoring, which is something to always keep in mind when you start your project um, to know where you're going. Okay, so first let's go through um, data collection. Um, so to be honest, nowadays with everything being surrounded with data, uh, knowing that every cloud, every app, every uh, organization is now using softwares, we almost have data available everywhere. So nowadays I feel confident to say that most of monitoring and evaluation projects will require data collection. And the tricky part is, is knowing how to differentiate what data is actually worth collecting and which one is not. So it's making sure that you're going to be using your time and your money, meaning resources as well, wisely. And as mentioned before, a lot of times with data collection, we tend to snowball into a huge scope and then we cannot finish ever or it becomes very confusing. Um, so I will be repeating this a lot throughout uh, today's module, but please remember to try to keep the scope simple 
and avoid this snowballing effect when you just start collecting data from different sources and you become invested and curious about what is going to be um, found out from this um, endeavor. And so also because sometimes when you are looking into uh, data collection and taking different resources and uh, different types of information, you want to always follow simple steps to guide the process and make sure you plan ahead. That's a very, um, very wise way to start the project and that will ensure your success. Um, throughout this module, we're going to be discussing uh, tools and methods. So I want to differentiate quickly both of them. So when, whenever we mention data collection tools, we're going to be talking about methods or the process that is used to collect the data. So the actual uh, method that you use. And then when you talk about data collection methodologies, that's gonna be referring to the set of tools or the framework as a complete whole approach to how you're going to um, collect the data that you need, okay? So in general, we're going to cover tools as the little pieces and the methodologies that will be the, the whole thing, okay? So for an easy overview of understanding how in a very high level general way, your project of data collection should look like in a step process, okay? So as you can see here in the little flowchart that I've included, the first step, as I always recommend, it should be to define the stop and the questions that you want to be answered. A lot of um, a lot of um, organizations that are a little bit more advanced in project management will have their own um, forms or already determined um, paperwork that you have to fill out or complete, defining a, a scope uh, and a project leader and stakeholders and everything. But if that's something that your organization or it's a new thing that you're going through, it does not have, then make sure to develop one yourself and define the scope so it's very clear for you, your team and your stakeholders. Second, you want to select appropriate tools and methodologies. So now that you know what is it that you want to do, now you go to the how. So how are you going to, to get the data that you want? And you're going to look into the different tools and the methodologies as a whole to make sure that you select whatever is the most appropriate one for whatever your main objective is. Then you're going to tell, de develop a data collection plan where you're going to include a budget with the resources that you're going to be needing and the time that you are going to take for each step of the data collection. Time is very important. It's your main resource and uh, you don't want to waste it. So just make sure to set time and deadlines so that you can hold yourself and your team accountable. Then you actually go and out of the world and collect the data that you need. And then the fifth um, a step here, even though I said that keep the scope from not snowballing, it's my experience that after you collect the data, there's always some little thing that needs adjustment or a little farther dive into the, that. So you're going to have some little new additional requirements. The important thing here is being able to recognize which of these additional requirements are something that you need for this specific project versus something that would be interesting to look into or something that is actually something big that you need to dive into on a different project with new resources, okay? So differentiating that, but making the adjustments that you need. And then finally, the sixth step is going to be the analysis and the results being presented to the stakeholder. This will probably it's like an iterate step with the next phase of the um, of data collection with monitoring and evaluation, but it's always important to keep it in mind as you define your scope and your um, your plan 
because everything that you collect will then work out to be analyzed and you want to collect information and things that are analyzable friendly so that you can um, facilitate either the work for yourself that you're going to be analyzing afterwards or whoever in the team will be taking on that responsibility. So there's some very general principles of data collection that I do want to mention or kind of repeat to emphasize. So throughout the data collection, make sure to keep things simple. And I say as possible, simple as possible, because depending on the project, data collection can get huge and you will need to do a lot of different pieces and manage, it, manage different information from different resources. But as much as you can, try to always keep it as simple as possible so that yourself and your teammates can keep track of what is going on and the sources of the information you're managing. Also, plan the data collection process in advance. Um, when we think about data collection, it's something that maybe for a small project, you are able to maybe wing it and just go out and ask and re re receive some information and put something together and understand it. But it's a very good practice to always even if it's something simple, just plan ahead. Even if it's two steps, just plan a little bit so that you're prepared and you're organized. And this will also help you at the moment of presenting the results. It builds trust for your stakeholders so that they can know that you put the work into getting everything clear for them. You always want to ensure reliability, credibility, and the validity of your data. Um, if the data that you collect, you don't completely trust it to be true, your stakeholders won't trust it either. And so probably your project is going to die after you collect the data. And of course, we always want to see our projects go ahead and comply with the objectives that you started. So make sure to always collect data that you know it's reliable and you know where it's coming from. And needless to say, but ethics in data collection is very important. So no, do not change the data. Be careful with uh, when you're managing numbers with decimal points, do not round it too much. Keep things very clear for yourself and your state. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about how successful monitoring and evaluation projects really rely on effective data collection. Um, it's important that we also remember that each project or situation is going to be different and will require different tools or, and set of tools or methodologies of data collection. And so there's no one size fit all for the data collection project. That's important to remember. So based on your own experience as a um, project participant or leader of these endeavors of data collection, you'll be learning and being able to identify easier which tools are the adequate to use. So as it's stated here in the slide, Successful data collection relies on adequate choice of tools applicable to each specific project or situation. Let's just talk of a random, very simple example. If you are trying to figure out the reason why a product, for example, is not selling as it used to, so you have a decline on sales and you are going out to, the, to um, gather information and data collection for figuring out why. And then you go and you review all your data and measures and things that are recorded in your own SAP um, system. You review all the orders being fulfilled on time. You have everything in quality matter checks off and everything looks really good. And then you come back and you realize that it's really that's not really the answer you were looking for because you still don't know why um, the product is not selling. 
So perhaps the data collection that you performed or the tools that you used in this case, uh, the measures and the information and the data in your system is not relevant to your objective, which more most likely would have been more eff effective if you were to go out of the organization, talk to people, do customer surveys, review data from the competition and looking into focus groups to understand what has changed on the mind of your consumer. So that's just a general kind of example, very simple to um, show you how the adequate choice of tools, tools can really impact how effective um, the data collection process was. Um, also, keep in mind, as we also re uh, mentioned before in the principles, is that the reliable and transparent data is key. Everyone has to be very clear on understanding what is going on with the data and where it's coming from. And the same happens with stakeholders. At the end of the day, you want to come collect a lot of data to present to someone. And that someone or that stakeholder must for sure trust the results that you presented. Um, otherwise, your project will be archived in, um, in a drawer and it's not going to be used in anything because if you're not trusting the results, then you cannot take, make decisions based on that data that you collected. Um, also, on the same lines of decisions and actions, uh, you have to remember that things need to be, um, that you have to be able to make decisions based on the data that you collected. So all the results and information you bring to the table need to bring something actionable. That means that you have to know that there is an action that comes after a finding. There's a lot of times that it's very interesting to learn something or collect some information or know what the customer is doing, but maybe under that situation, it's not really something you can do about it. And that basically what could be a waste of your time. Also remember to keep the data that you collect um, in focus of telling a story that is relevant and easy to understand to your stakeholders. I can honestly speak the truth about that. I, when I started my work in an oil and gas company, everybody was an engineer, so I was very used to presenting data and collecting data in a very mathematical engineer way. Um, so my answer was always focused on numbers and results, right? Um, but when I moved the transition into a children's hospital and I was speaking and presenting findings or collecting data for doctors and nurses um, about the, the process in the hospital, then you realize, I quickly am realizing that everything that I was presenting kind of looked like this picture on the bottom for them. It looked like no one was understanding what I was presenting because it was too technical. And I was going too deep into finding the numbers and the science behind the data. I was going too deep into the data collection um, in terms of numbers. While they might have wanted more things and qualitative responses, more things that they can understand and are relevant to them. So again, remember, there's no one size fits all and you have to be, see which tools are applicable for the project. And also based on your experience, you're going to be learning um, what you need to be focusing every time. I will give you a couple of tips of things that you must include on a basis so that you are always sure to cover all your jobs. All right. So now that we've covered the data collection overview and um, process flow principles and success tips, um, let's talk about software. So for the purposes of this module, we're going to use a Microsoft Excel and R Studio as the example of how you're gonna choose which software to use. 
um, of course, there's so many data um, analytics softwares out there that it's really up to you to decide which ones you want to use. And sometimes you don't really, you can't really decide because maybe your organization just uses one specific one. So first of all, before you choose any software, again, in this case, we're going to compare Excel and R, you're going to want to have a clear project objective and the scope defined. So you're going to ask yourself, do I have this already defined? Am I clear of what's the objective and the scope? So make sure you have these answers before you choose. The other question you need to ask yourself is that if do I know what type of data and information I will need? So if you already described an objective and a scope, and we go back to our we go back to our process here, you can see you define a scope. Now you go to the how. You want to know what tools you're going to use because you are know, and then step number three, you know what type of data you're going to be managing. In this case, you focus on understanding if you're going to be comparing industry standards or maybe a specific performance indicators. Will you use a large or a small sample size? How big is the database that you're going to be using, analyzing, and handling? And also, is your database or the information that the that data you're going to collect, is it descriptive and qualitative data, or is it continuous numbers that you're going to record? These are very important to understand on the type of data that you'll be handling, because Different softwares will always have more strengths or challenges depending on the type and the size of the, of the, of the data. Also, another thing that it's important uh, to remember, and this is something that maybe the books won't tell you, but based on experience, I can recommend you to ask yourself also, what is the organization and the stakeholders um, situation um, for monitoring and evaluation. Are they doing this project that you're working on and for in collecting data for a monitoring and evaluation event um, project? Is this the first time the organization is being exposed to this process or are they very number analytics focused? So going back to my previous example of me presenting very number wise uh, things to a set of doctors that maybe they were not interested Ask yourself again, what are they more comfortable with? Um, am I going to dive very deep in numbers or am I going to just present general results or for more interactive storytelling type of presentation? Okay, so try to understand that before you use a very scientific software to present something to doctors like I did. Um, also, Remember to think what is going to happen with the data that you collect. Is it going to continuously be used hereafter and it's going to continuously be updated or this is a, just an, a project that is going to be a one-time thing? So this will change things because maybe a software is going to be easier to just compute, clean up the data and analyze results. Um, versus another one might be easier to program or set up by an algorithm so that it can continuously keep on doing things and analyzing it and giving you results in future situations when you want to um, update the data. For example, one example for that would be, um, uh, let's say you are going to collect data to generate key performance indicators for a specific area of the organization. You're going to for sure be using the information and the set of steps that you're doing to collect data in a periodic time, maybe a monthly base or maybe a quarter base, but it's going to be repeated. So maybe in that, under that case, it's going to be easier to use our studio program um, a set of algorithms and teach the, the computer and the software to do it for you. And then you just have to load the database every month or every quarter and it will do it for you. Um, 
if it's just one time thing, maybe it's not worth it to invest all the time to program and create a thought, um, an algorithm, a machine learning approach for something that you're just gonna be doing once. So something to think about a general example. But make sure, again, to ask yourself these questions when deciding what software you want to use. Once you feel comfortable with these answers, uh, with, with these answers, then you will be easy for you to choose which software is going to be the one that you need. So let's start with Microsoft Excel. I do want to give you uh, some um, information or Probably you know, or if you're familiar with Excel, you already know this, but it's always important to keep it in mind. So Excel is very good, and the positive sides for Excel is that it's very widely available. Almost all organizations have it. They all, everyone uses it and or know how to um, handle it in the basic name way. There's also a lot of many options for built-in functions like um, SQL, and you can really go very fancy on programming in Excel. So Excel has a very wide range of doing things very simple and then getting it very nice with Power BI and all those nice um, add-ins that now you have, right? And it's also, in my experience, um, when your organization that you're working at, it's not very number focus or they are not very familiar with let's say machine learning and artificial intelligence and all the data analytics and stuff is new sometimes microsoft excel using excel could be used as a buy-in with the stakeholders and the organization if they're not so tech savvy maybe they're going to be less challenged or feel more comfortable talking to you and looking into results in Microsoft Excel, which is something that they are familiar with, so you're finding a common ground, and that will help them be more involved um, in the new project for monitoring and evaluation versus you coming in and showing them like this machine learning, machine learning um, software that does all these fancy things, and they will go look, shut down themselves because for them this is too new. There's no common ground, ground that they can find with your project. And sometimes you have to make those sacrifices because you want to make sure that your project actually hits the results and the buy-in from the stakeholder. Now let's talk about the challenges. Um, Microsoft Excel, depending on the capacity of the computer that you're using or um, yeah, the memory you have or how big the data set that you're working on is, it might not be very efficient. You're having your, your computer being frozen all the time and repeating the work and taking you longer if it's a very big data set. So maybe just don't go there or you'll have to do an extra step of dividing the data set and working with smaller sets of data so that and the computer doesn't freeze. But maybe another software like, for example, RStudio is going to be able to handle that pretty easily. Also, in my experience, even though there's a lot of add-ins and you can program, um, it's not the easiest software to use for quantitative data sets. So if you're analyzing um, something that is not numbers, sometimes it, it can get a little tricky. Um, it's Definitely for Microsoft Excel, it's more time consuming to TD up the data sets for you to analyze. Um, depending on how tech savvy you are or how experienced in Microsoft Excel you are, maybe you can do this very quickly um, versus someone that is maybe not so experienced. So that's something you have to be evaluating, but these are things to, um, to think about. I've wrote here some very general examples for you to think about. So for example, if you are using surveys answers or collecting survey answers that are multiple choice um, and it's a medium sized um, software, then just go with Microsoft Excel. Don't complicate your, thing, your life and just go ahead and use it. Of course, if that's a software that you feel comfortable with. 
Um, also, for example, if you have number of measures that you have recorded from observations and it's not really that many and it's been inputted from an Excel form, so it's already in the system, you can just use it. As long as you feel comfortable with it, it's the most important thing. You have to be the one being very comfortable and um, and secure <laughs> when you come to present results um, in either software that you use. Now let's discuss RStudio. So it's very popular right now. Um, it does amazing things, but you do have to know the language. You do now have to know how to write um, and code in the in R. So that's definitely one of the challenges we will be discussing. But on the positive side, um, it can analyze qualitative information, like for example, reviews for customer reviews and things like that, which makes it in, in with a couple of code lines, you can really do this very easily. You can go for machine learning and forecasting and creating algorithms that you will be using in the future, which is very helpful um, and easy to manage and save time. It's very efficient with large data sets. Um, it's also very easy to use because it's an open source, as you know, so and you can even if the co-organization is not familiar with it, you can still use it. Um, and it's really good and, and for TD up um, the data sets and the, for the analysis, you can code a little couple of lines and it can clear everything and just pick everything that you want and put in the format that you need it for analyzing. So it's very good. And also the visualization graphs, once you know how to use them, those look great. And they can do all those fancy ones that turn around and you can very like so really impress your stakeholders with it. Now the challenges. Um, just make sure, as I mentioned, if you don't choose this software, if you're not 100% confident on how to use the language. So don't try to seem fancy and very, um, very text heavy and just choose RStudio to show off your new skills. Don't do that because um, your stakeholders will see through it. <laughs> and it's better to make sure that you feel very comfortable with it when you're going to use it, okay? And also to make sure that if you have a tight timeline, um, you don't want the software making you um, waste time or do more time consuming because you have to be learning on the go as you use it. And then also, as I mentioned before in my examples, it could cause some resistance from the stakeholders if they are very new to the monitoring and evaluation and they're not very tech savvy. As I mentioned, they can go like, oh, I have no idea what this person is presenting and this fancy software is too much for me. I don't wanna, I, I won't even look at it. So things to consider. But as examples of when you would like to use RStudio instead of Excel, would be if you collected or downloaded a bunch of a really big data uh, set from customer reviews or, for example, surveys or questionnaires that have responses that are open-ended, and you have to analyze that and you're going to be looking for a specific um, set of words, where R will be for sure the, so the software to use. It's going to be easier and it's good to, it's good, it performs really well on that. Um, also, another example will be if you collected data in the first phase, as a first phase for a future forecasting and machine learning approach. So, you know, if you can, you will be doing this ongoing approaches, as I mentioned before, as an example. Um, so you just might want for the start uh, code a couple of lines that will be able to generate the same results afterwards. And one last little parenthesis or disclosure regarding the challenges of our studio. I did mention that um, just don't use it if you're not 100% confident, but I do want to do a little disclosure in this. Um, I, by that, I don't mean that if your organization or where you're working for this project 
is very into our studio and that's the software they are normally using, don't try to force a different one just because you're not 100% confident or very experienced um, on that language or maybe the functionality of the language that you're going to be using. Um, what I mean is really make sure that you're very transparent. If you're going for our studio, it's okay. And if you're not very expert on it, it's fine too. But just calculate the time and add in some time for you to develop the skill to practice or add some extra time so that you can learn how to use it or involve other stakeholders or team members that do have the experience so that they can support you through the process. Just remember not to, um, the main thing here is not to pretend to be very uh, proficient when you're not. Um, but for all means, go ahead and use it if that's the best application or the best resource to use for your project. Um, just make sure you rely on experts and teammates and other people to make sure things go smoothly. And okay, so let's move on and let's look into now some of the basic data collection tools. Um, these are going to be very common strategies, some of them even common sense, but we're going to go through them and just talk about it. So the first one we're going to be discussing are interviews. So these are very common. And when we talk about interviews, we're not only talking about like a formal interview. You could, but it's also an informal conversation that you can have, or maybe a remote conversation through, through Zoom. Now they very common, but you want to know and make sure that you include people in the data collection that are very experienced and knowledgeable about the subject or the process that you're looking into okay so these these interviews can even be through groups or at all also not only one-on-one -on -one. Um, but as we're going to look into that later interviews are essential to all data collection and even if you make it more in a formal manner or not you're going to find yourself that you're always doing interviews for um, for data collection purposes, sometimes just to get some background, some understanding of what you're looking for. And even these interviews will be happening as you're defining the scope, because these interviews will give you the information that you need to define the next steps. So always make sure that you're talking to people uh, related to the to the area of study that you're working on. If you're not talking to people, take it as a red flag and tell yourself, okay, I need to speak to everyone involved, okay? So um, especially people who are the ones performing the process or are the owners of, um, of, the, of, of the specific project that you're working on. If you are going to be looking into someone else's work, make sure to speak with them first and kind of get that confidence going before you really even start. Um, now, again, let's go with a focus group uh, discussion. This one is going to be a lot more formal guided group discussion that you want to find an in-depth information of why, when, and how for any specific topic, okay? Um, a focus group has to be done with a certain kind of structure to be called a focus group. And the participants, it's very important that the participants are unbiased and are also falling under the right persona, I call it, um, which means the right profile of person who you are want to know the answers for. So, um, specific topics uh, will be discussed and there is going to be uh, somebody guiding the process and the discussion and asking open-ended questions to um, the group so that the discussion can guide and, find, and you can find some answers. Focus groups are a lot more valuable when you're talking about a niche, um, meaning something very specific um, about a product, a process, a situation, or an opinion that you're looking into to gather information. Um, 
than just general things. You want to know a specific opinions or points of views of how people are taking it. So it's going to be a lot more of a perspective information that you're looking into more than like um, scientific result. So you want to choose a focus group whenever you are looking for some more explorative um, and more qualitative information that quantitative okay and just always keep in mind that just don't go ahead and find your friends and family to join the focus group you really have to find people who are the right ones who give you the actual answers that you want to find so you will need people in your group that have some expertise in this area. Sometimes um, marketing people are very knowledgeable about this and have experience. And so you can um, include them in your teams or maybe do some, um, some interviews with them so that you can learn of the process. And that way you can have um, the right focus group discussion. Next, let's talk about observation. This one is also very common and as the word says, it's very simple, but the normal and more like formal way of conducting observation would be to actually record information using checklists. Um, you can be involved in teams and get a lot of information, but you have to take, in mind, take into consideration that when in the, you rely only on observation, you have to know that it's prone to errors because if you're recording information manually, there can be some errors. So just keep that in mind. So when you design the checklist or when you're actually checking it, make sure to correct those or even error proof it from the beginning. Um, but observation is key especially when you're talking about um, processes or different other um, comp um, behaviors that you want to look into, uh, things like that. Observation is very valuable um, for you to be kind of like the spectator of what's happening. Um, it's important also to prepare in advance and know what you're going to go observe. Um, don't just join the process and wing it and like, oh, I'm just going to look around. You're probably going to waste your time because when you come back, you're going to have a lot of other questions and things that you want to look into. So just kind of plan it ahead and have like a bullet point of what is it that you're going to be reviewing. Um, okay, so photography and video. Um, this is kind of a part that will complement the observation because as you know, we can't be there 24 hours a day to see everything. Um, so it's very useful to complement what you're looking for in observation. Um, it's also very good for visuals and it will help um, your stakeholders and presentations of the information afterwards when you're talking about behaviors or specific things that you want to show. It's a um, great source for visuals um, for after. Just make sure to also keep in mind, again, um, not going down the rabbit hole and losing yourself and looking up through all the videos and too many photographs. Um, just, again, have a plan and know what exactly what you're looking for and go for that. And once you find it, move on to the next phase. Um, another option for data collection is the case studies and stories of change. These are very, very helpful when you want to understand specific topics um, that are probably new to your organization or yourself. So you're usually talking about um, behaviors of people and other organizations and even policies that a comp um, company or um, government even can uh, impose regarding certain um, situations. So these are very, very helpful. And nowadays that research and uh, it's a lot more popular to have um, publications and have things published in different um, in magazines, uh, 
other webinars and things like that, there's a lot of information you can find from case studies and stories of change. So always make sure to check the sources. That's very important. No, don't just Google something and then fall into like an influencer story of how they manage some change. No, make sure to check the sources that they actually have a specific um, books and related articles that they have studied and how the results actually impacted. And once you read the case study, also it's important to maybe do a separate Google search on what happened after. So sometimes we find a lot of stories of change, for example, of um, how a company solved specific problems and they show you in the story of change and the case studies like something super successful that they did but then when you actually look what happened five years later you find that uh, for example the person who was leading the change left the company and then that change kind of died and they weren't able to complete it and the company didn't um, successfully overcome that challenge they're actually going through it still so Things like that are important to go a little deeper and understand before using it as an example to follow. Then we also have surveys and questionnaires. These are something that we tend to want to do for almost all type of um, project or data collection when it involves people. We always want to know what the people want and it's an easy one to do because you just complete a form with questions and have and some random people uh, answer it. Um, nowadays, it's a lot easier with a lot of tools that are out there, like, I don't know, SurveyMonkey and even Google has uh, specific forms that you can use to gather surveys and questionnaires and analyze it pretty, pretty easy. The tricky part about surveys and questionnaires I would say is actually doing it in the right way and as we also discussed before for uh, focus groups it's also important to remember that you have to target your audience and the people who are going to be answering your questions have to fall under the persona or the niche or the actual target market related to um, the relevant topic that your data collection project is about. Uh, you don't want to just gather information about people who are not related to it. So if you are talking about in a specific update on a phone and you want to know what's the opinion on how this new app change um, is good or bad for your, your users, if you go and interview and have surveys responses from users that don't use iPhone, but they use Samsung and they're not very exposed to what you're having, then those responses are not gonna be useful for you. So just remember that as any number wise um, a strategy, surveys are also valuable when more answers come in. So when you have large numbers, with, you have to follow three stages. You'll have to do sampling, you'll have to do standard questions, and then you have to have analysis methods, okay? So we tend to a lot of times think, oh, survey is very easy, just send it out and some people will respond and we'll have some information. Just again, focus on always having the target audience that you want to answer. So that's important to have questions that are built logically that will also filter out people who are not uh, on your target. So for example, if you are going to find out something about a specific target age for millennials, then maybe one of the important questions to ask at the beginning is what's your age range? If the person answers that they're not an age range of a millennial, then you know that survey answer is not valuable for you and you can exclude it from the analysis afterwards. That's something very important to include so that you can narrow down interactively the answers that are valuable for you. Um, 
And then also think about the ways um, you build the answer so that the questions are not going to be leading the person to one specific answer or maybe answer too many questions that people at the middle of it will decide that this is too much and they don't want to really complete it. So again, it's important to have a little bit of experience and learn the process. So if someone in your team has a little bit of experience, um, try it. And then there's always a good idea to actually have the survey first. And then you can send it out to just like a small group of people first and get some feedback and know what are, what are their thoughts, if, if it's actually working and if, 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 if the, the questions are confusing or not. And then you have like a little trial to tweak things and make it better before you send it out to a lot of people and have to repeat it if afterwards you realize there's any changes to be made. So those are a couple of recommendations for that. And then benchmarking. Benchmarking is very important. So this means to be to review how others have confronted the same problem. It's usually how you compare yourself with peers or even the competition, you can benchmark yourself. Um, as I mentioned before with case studies, you're also understanding a, like a wider topic and in a general matter. And the benchmarking is just you're comparing, trying to compare apples to apples. If I do this, how is my competition doing? So benchmarking, for example, with data collection, in my experience, we did this a lot in the hospital. Um, we benchmark price. Um, I used to work in the supply chain area. So we were looking at contracts and how much are we paying as hospital for this specific supply for the hospital. So let's talk syringes. So let's say the hospital, uh, we are paying a certain amount for a syringe. And then we do a data collection on benchmarking, looking into how much we believe um, my peers or my competition are paying for the same exact syringe. So then you can look into, there's our, there are tools out there that help you in this specific example for supply chain supplies in medical field. Um, there, is, um, there is some companies or group purchasing organizations that will leave you, give you, not give you the exact number because they can't uh, reveal the confidential information for the contract, but they can tell you um, a percentile or where you're standing. So if you are actually in the first, you do a benchmarking report and then sometimes we come back with the syringe report and we know that our benchmarking analysis reports that we are in the percentile 10. So that means we as a hospital are having the best price in the market. So we don't want to look at it. We are good with that. We know that we're doing great. Um, but sometimes the syringe report with the benchmarking, maybe for this specific syringe, we are in the percentile 80, which means that we are paying a lot more than our peers and competition for this product. And based on that, we can take a decision to approach the contract owner and recommend management to actually renegotiate that price because it's not very competitive in the market. So that's an example of how benchmarking can be used. But you can also use it in a very general way. Like for example, you are starting a new warehouse and you, your project requires you to collect data on how other warehouses are working. So maybe you ask a peer or another company that is an expert in warehousing. So maybe Amazon and ask them, okay, I am a hospital and I want to learn how do I can I can do this. So you can also use the term benchmarking for to compare yourself and see how would someone else manage these warehouse operations and what can I learn from that and translate it to my operations. So those are a couple of examples that can be helpful for benchmarking. Um, okay, so let's go for direct messenger measures. I'm sorry. Um, this is the best option to measure changes that impact the specific performance indicators. And you can manually record it or it can be recorded in a tool. So to be honest, direct measures right now as nowadays is, are very common because there is a 
there are clouds of information, everybody, different softwares and different systems in the organizations that record a lot of data. So in general, you have timestamps, you have measures, you have dates um, that you can use as direct measures that are recorded already there available for you. You just need to know what you're looking for. Um, a lot of times when you're talking about performance indicators and things that you're going to use for future monitoring and evaluating, direct measures are something that is mostly always used, okay? Um, just make sure to understand where and how the system is recorded or who is recording it so that you know that the information is accurate. Um, there's a lot of times that you rely on softwares and you think, oh, it's all done in real time. But then when you actually speak to the person who inputs the information, you find out that they actually don't do it at real time, but they accumulate a set of orders. And then at the end of the day, they input everything. And then you are having some, um, some information that is not 100% accurate. And depending on what you're looking for, it might still work or maybe it does not serve the purpose that you want. So again, make sure you go back and understand how reliable and how much um, the, the information is real time and you trust it. Then we also have secondary data. There's again, a lot of data out there. When you talk about direct measures, you're probably talking more about your internal operations and your systems. When you talk about secondary data, you are talking about outside sources, like for example, governments. In the US, there is a lot of government databases that you can use. And a lot of times it's very helpful. Um, let's go to uh, understanding why some certain um, purchasing behaviors have changed for your, um, for your general consumers. And then, you want to maybe look into secondary data of, for example, the government and data about um, unemployment. Maybe in your area or where you're selling your product or service, maybe unemployment is record high. And so people have not, don't have the same resources and that's why they're not consuming your service or product as often as before. So you can use that information, understand that's something very general and obvious, but these examples can translate to let you know something that is going outside and data that you have uh, to find trends and maybe correlations with your own results. And that will help you also evaluate and then make decisions in the future. And then I wanna say that this next one is one of the most important, which is informal monitoring and walk the process. I am an industrial engineer, so maybe that's where it's coming from, but um, I want to say that it, this is very, very important. Sometimes we take it for granted and we don't do it as much as we should. And this one is one of the most important tools because this is where you're actually having conversations, observations, and you're immersing yourself in the process or the problem so that you can actually understand what's your, what is it that you're working on and what data you really need to collect. And there's a lot of gold information that you can find if you actually walk the process. I wanna speak in a part of an experience when you come into a project and maybe your data collection or you're working on monitoring and evaluating a, a, a specific area or project that you're not the owner of. And so sometimes we feel that we're very experienced and it's, oh, that means that look sounds or seems very obvious. And so you just go ahead and collect data and forget to walk the process and see everything for yourself. Um, this step is very important for two purposes. One for yourself, because you wanna be the one who understands the process most because you're the one collecting the data and going to be working on it. So you are going to be, you have to become an expert on it. And the only way to become an expert is actually walking the process and understanding it. And then the second purpose that really is important is that it creates reports and 
makes the people who are actually the owners or participants of the project or the process itself to respect you and welcome you into their working area. A lot of times when you come from outside and have opinions on someone else's work that maybe they're doing it like that for ages and they're the experts and you come here with a different opinion and you don't even know what you're talking about and that's the perception that the user or the, the process owner has, they're going to completely shut you up and they probably won't even cooperate with you to give you the information that you need. And so maybe you are going to be collecting data and doing a lot of things that are not really the important piece that you need. So as part of an investigator that you're you being as data collector, you wanna be the one that people trust and the one that they want to welcome and a lot of times when the people want to welcome you into their process and share their problems with you and share what are the things that you, they need um it's exactly when you show interest when you are humble and you tell them you are the expert i am not let me learn and that way i can help you collect the data that we all need so that things are monitored and evaluated and we can move from today to a future state that is going to be better and more successful for everyone. So just don't take it for granted and go and put yourself out there and learn the process yourself.